So today we wrap up our sermon series on our Unitarian Universalist roots by exploring the legacy of Theodore Parker. He was a Unitarian who lived during the first half of the 19th century. He served our congregation in West Roxbury, which was once a quaint hamlet outside of Boston and now is basically part of the city. Parker, like so many of our progenitors, is a complicated character. He was a brilliant man who made several contributions to Unitarian theology, but his theology and his willingness to speak about social matters from the pulpit were ahead of his time. Because of this, he was never accepted by the elite Unitarian circles, and he was actually shunned later in his life. After taking a trip to Europe, Parker came back convinced that America could not progress as a democracy as long as the institution of slavery stood. And I think it is important to note that he was also, like many people of his time, a student of ethnology, and he believed that whites were a superior race and wrote about that too. As I said, it's a common attitude at the time, and I don't share that information to disparage him, but rather just to be honest. When we talk about our history, we can't just gloss over the gross things and only pay attention to what we're proud of. So despite his views on race, Parker was dedicated to the abolition of slavery. He vehemently opposed the Fugitive Slave Act, and he became minister at large to fugitive slaves that were living in Boston. He is best known for having kept a pistol in his pulpit to defend fugitive slaves who were living on the church's property. Some of his most well-known works were abolitionist lectures. And the most famous of these was called Justice and the Conscience, and it was delivered in 1852. It includes a passage which is excerpted on the opening part of your order of service. It said, look at the facts of the world. You see a continual progress of triumph of the right I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but a little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. But from what I see, I am sure that it bends towards justice. Things refuse to be mismanaged for long. Many of us will be familiar with the arc imagery, later repeated by Martin Luther King Jr., and then again later by President Barack Obama. Theodore Parker began that sermon by talking about the laws of physics which are observable. For example, we can observe that objects at rest tend to stay at rest until they are put in motion. Parker believed that there was also an observable, an, an observable law for the human spirit which was called justice. He called this the law of right. But unlike the laws of physics, we cannot visually observe and measure the laws of the human spirit. History, for Parker, served as the means of observation by which the law of right could be studied. He believed that each of us have free will, and we can use that for good or for evil. But ultimately, he wrote that the minor forces, after a while, are sure to be overcome by the great general moral force, pass into the current, and be borne along in the moral stream of the universe. Though Parker believed that our individual lives and our individual actions were just a small part of a vast equation that eventually totaled up to justice. Even if a person does bad things, their actions will be outweighed by the greater justice, and that will always prevail. Now, Parker was not naive about the injustice that exists in the world. Remember, the purpose of that lecture was to convince others that slavery was immoral. He wasn't saying that it doesn't matter what you do, because eventually somebody else will do something to outweigh it. It was not a, uh, an injustice offset program. The arc of the moral universe is long, but bends towards justice. What he's saying is that it is inevitable that the institution of slavery will fall. 
He was not making an excuse for the anti-abolitionists. He was putting the anti-abolitionists on notice. Right will eventually have the day with or without you. Get on board or don't. You're going to lose. That's what he was saying. <coughs> this willingness to put to use the pulpit to influence social causes is perhaps Parker's greatest contribution to our religious tradition. It seems natural to us now, but it was radical at the time. Our own congregation's social and environmental justice committee supports efforts in the areas of economic inequality, homelessness, LGBTQ issues, racial inequality, gun violence, climate change, and more. You hear about that from the pulpit, from me and from them. We work hard at social justice in this congregation and throughout our association. I want to share an example with you from a few years ago during my time working with youth. I spent most of my adult life working with teenagers, which is why I am sarcastic and surly. <laughs> <laughs> I once took a group of junior high students to volunteer for an afternoon at an organization that gives Christmas gifts to children whose families were struggling. Our job was to sort through donations and to select gifts for those kids. We were given giant plastic bags, trash bags, with labels that told us the name, the age, the clothing size, and the gender of those kids in need. And we wandered through the rooms and we collected toys and other gifts, basically deciding what those kids were going to get for Christmas. I worked with two sixth grade boys that day, and the first five or six kids that we drew were all girls, their age and younger. And one of them, wide-eyed with panic, exclaimed, I don't know what girls like. <laughs> <laughs> and the other took a deep breath, literally went like this, I have a sister. <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> and he could. <clears throat> Figuring out what a girl might like wasn't the only difficulty that these two guys faced that day. There were questions like, what if we pick out something she doesn't like? What if she already has it? What if we give her a DVD and she doesn't have a DVD player? Is it a good idea to get her something that needs batteries? What if her family can't get more batteries later and it just makes her more sad? So we worked through each of these questions and these struggles as they came up, and as the afternoon went on, they gained more confidence and they needed less help from me. They really knocked it out of the park and did a great job once they got past that fear of getting it wrong. A few weeks later, the youth gathered to reflect on that service experience, and I asked them to fill in the blank. When I help others, I feel blank. We went around the room and each one of them said the sentence and filled in the blank. And they said things like happy, connected, grateful, and proud. When I've asked groups of adults what social justice work feels like to them, I get responses like unsure, inadequate, queasy, ill equipped. Questions of whether our actions will really lead to any good can be agonizing. We just can't know whether or not we're actually creating good in the world. And we worry that our actions might actually make things worse. We feel overwhelmed by the need. But you guys, we do this as part of our faith. And faith is different than knowing. One of the most outstanding sacred texts for times of turmoil and uncertainty is the Bhagavad Gita. There are only two characters in the Bhagavad Gita. There's Arjuna, who is an everyman character and represents all of humanity. And there's Lord Krishna, who instructs Arjuna in moral philosophy. The setting for the text is they are on a battlefield. Arjuna has been called, he's a great warrior, been called to defend the kingdom, which is uh, potentially going to be usurped by his uncles and cousins. And he has this moment of, it is right to defend the kingdom, but it is wrong to kill my family. So what do I do? And Krishna stops time, and they sit down and have this long, lengthy, beautiful, 
heartrending discussion about the nature of right and wrong. That is the context in which that passage occurs. In this portion of that discussion, Krishna teaches Arjuna about karma yoga, the yoga of right action. In karma yoga, selfless action is a means to transcendence, and right action becomes a prayer. Karma yoga is not really so much about bodily postures. It is exclusively focused on right action. Arjuna is in knots because he doesn't know what the right action is. And he is told, on this path, the path of karma yoga, you can only move in one direction, forward. On this path, no effort is wasted, no gain is ever reversed. Where Arjuna was getting lost, where all of us get lost, is in thinking that right and wrong is determined by the outcome of our actions, whether or not that cake turns out or not sprout grows. Outcomes are unpredictable, and that is why we sometimes have those unintended consequences. <coughs> Krishna instructs Arjuna that an action that is done for the sake of the action rather than its outcome, that is the right action. That is the better path. When we act from a place of conviction and we are ready to accept any result, we move beyond our inner turmoil. As verse 48 says, that is the evenness of mind that is yoga, yoga meaning union. The outer and the inner come together. Our inner conflict is resolved. Perfection, transcendence, the place beyond sorrow is not achieved through always getting it right. If there's one thing you hear today, let that be it. Getting it right is not what leads us to happiness. It's what leads us into knots. Happiness comes from having faith that the results of our action are all grist for the mill. When we let go of trying to control what we cannot, which is basically everything, our inner churning over making the right choice is put to rest and we can experience peace, union, yoga. We cannot possibly know what the results of our actions will be. The authors of the Bhagavad Gita knew that some 2,400 years ago. Theodore Parker knew it 107 years ago. The stakes were high in the ancient world. They were high in antebellum America, and they remain high today. These texts were not written to ease the urgency that we feel about doing the right thing. They are written to ease the minds of people overwhelmed by the enormity of pain and suffering in this world. Our fear of getting it wrong can hamstring us, but these texts assure us that we can have faith that our efforts for good are not wasted. They are magnified in that moral stream of the universe. I think that the fear and anxiety that gripped my sixth grade companions so many years ago is something we can all relate to. They knew that putting gifts in those bags was the right thing to do, but they were also convinced that they were somehow going to get it wrong. And they almost let that fear derail them. But they stayed the course. They acted for the sake of action. Any gift that we put in that bag led to good. We can have faith in that. Even if we put something in there that was not wanted, we made a little girl feel good because she got something. She knew that somebody tried. The arc of the moral universe is indeed long, but it does bend towards justice. Mistakes that we make while trying to tread that path cannot possibly take that arc off course. That arc existed before us, and it will exist long after us. When we have a clear opportunity for justice work, let us not be stymied or befuddled by our limited ability to perceive that arc. Let us act for the sake of action, resolute, that our works will lead to good, eventually. May we have faith down to our 